We leave our studios for this episode of The Ball Report. We're on the road to Levington, Illinois for a trip to Farrell Farms to meet Phil Farrell and his family of Clydesdale horses. Phil and his horses are known worldwide. And coming up, we'll explain why this majestic working breed is so popular. Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of the Power Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston. Okaw Vet Clinic in Tuscola and Dr. Sally Foote remind you to properly take care of your pets and are happy to help support the Paw Report on WEIU. Okaw Vet Clinic located at 140 West Sale Street in downtown Tuscola. More information available at okawvetclinic.com. Thanks for joining us for this edition of the Paw Report. I am your host, Kelly Runyon, and as you can see, we are not in the studios of WEIU today. We decided to take our show on the road, and we are in Lovington, Illinois, at Farrell Farms. And a familiar guest joins us on the episode today. We're joined by Phil Farrell. You may remember him from a few years back, another production we produce here at WEIU, Heartland Highways. We came out, visited the farm, and talked to you a little bit then about the Clydesdale. And as I produce the shows and come up with topics, uh, you came to mind again. And I thought, I'm going to give Phil a call and decide if we could come out and see the farm again and maybe see your your horses again. I just remember that day fondly going up to the fence and the big Clydesdales coming over and sniffing and wanting a treat every now and then. So thanks <laughs> for joining us, Phil. Good to have you here. We are on the farm, uh, a very historic and old farm that's been in your family for many, many years. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about the history of, of where we're at today and, and how it's evolved over the years. Okay, our family settled here in 1850 uh, farm was purchased from the government and um, since that time there's always been horses and livestock uh, mostly dairy cattle some sheep and goats here and there uh, and during that time every generation has uh, broken trained horses uh, done farrier work made shoes, put shoes on horses, uh, kind of anything you can do with horses and livestock we've done here, I guess. And that's just passed on to every generation, basically. And you've always had Clydesdales, but Clydesdale isn't the only type of uh, workhorse that you've had here. You've had other, you've had a lot of breeds here. We have, and um, over the years we've handled uh, light horses, ponies, uh, all kind of saddle horses, show horses, race horses, uh, we have a, a large variety of customers and clients that we uh, uh, are buyers, sellers, agents for, as well as uh, training and transportation and all. So uh, uh, we get to see a lot of different things, a lot of different places, uh, a lot of different kinds of horses and customer needs and wants. And mm -hmm. uh, so we, we've handled a lot of different, different breeds. Let's talk specifically about the breed of the Clydesdale. What is the history of this majestic animal? It dates back hundreds of years. Yeah, they've been around a long time. They were developed in Scotland near the River Clyde in Lanarkshire. And as I understand it, Lanarkshire translates to mean Clydesdale, is how this the name came about. And, um, there are recordings in stud books uh, back as far as at least 1837 where the, the stallions were used to breed mares in that area and then in about 1877 i believe it was a uh, association uh, society was started uh, in scotland to uh, record and track and register all the horses 1879 the u.s started association to do the same thing so they've they've been around a long time. Their trip to the U.S. was not an easy one, um, as you can imagine, trying to get um, 
that big of an animal uh, to the states was quite the challenge. It really was. Uh, horses don't do well riding on ships. Uh, I don't know if it's the sea leg thing or what, but a lot of them got sick. There was a death loss on every shipment on the early, early uh, shipments. Um, we fly all the horses nowadays. Uh, they do very well on planes, but um, there's, there's no one that I know that uh, tries to bring them sea go across the sea now but that's what that's what they tried to do they did uh, do that Scotland. they they did do that they were successful with with horses but like I say there were a lot of problems uh, they didn't lose all of them and at one point there was a ship that was lost at sea that had uh, I think 25 head on and lost all of those mm. but um, uh, as time progressed, more and more people wanted to bring them into the U.S., and it did to get the, the breed started here. And, and I say more and more people, I mean, when I was a kid, there wasn't that many uh, being raised, actually. So uh, it's not like there's, you know, vast majority, even today, there's between four and 500 foals a year registered is all mm -hmm. that there is. There are guesstimates there's maybe 5,000 head uh, in North America. So theoretically, they qualify to be on the watch list uh, because of the low numbers, but the uh, reality is there's not any problem barring any major, major disaster that would uh, uh, eliminate the breed at this point. So take us through their origin in the U.S. Uh, like say early on, back in the late 1800s, uh, there were several guys that brought some in. The, the most famous was during Prohibition when uh, the Bush family uh, brought the, the uh, original hitch horses in, got a wagon and harness and all together and presented it to their dad. Uh, at the end of Prohibition, they took the hitch to Washington, D.C. with the first legal uh, case of beer <laughs> to present to uh, the guys there in Washington. And uh, Budweiser, of course, is the well-known, most well-known of any of them. And, and uh, you know, they have traveled to all corners of the U.S., been in Canada, and, and uh, they... Uh, at any given time had over the years kept uh, probably in the vicinity of 200 head counting the horses on the road as well as the breeding farm and um, uh, at one point they kept three eight horse hitches traveling and then they would uh, have uh, hitches go out to special events from St. Louis or one of their other breweries and all. And they kept horses at all the breweries and Bush Gardens mm -hmm. and SeaWorld and all of that. And uh, that's been back down now since the company was sold as well. But they're, they're still, it's an icon and they're still using them and still advertising. And I, I doubt there's very many people in the US or Canada that doesn't know who uh, the Budweiser Clydesdales are. They're just so majestic in stature. Mm -hmm. And that leads me to my next question about their their characteristics. What can you tell us about? I mean, we know the, the feathered feet, you know, the, the white on their uh, on their bodies, which is which is just so awesome to look at. But how big are they? How big do they get? How much do they eat a day? Mm -hmm. They will Mature ones will weigh 2,000 to 22, 2,300. Um, they will probably average 18 hands tall at the withers, which is at the base of the mane at the neck. And a hand is four inches. So if you envision what, what 18 hands would be, that's a very big horse. And because of the show ring and just everybody wanting everything bigger these days, there are a lot of horses that are now pushing 19 hands. And uh, that's kind of the popular thing. The bigger you can get them to be, the, mm -hmm. the more popular they are. And what about their um, coloring? 
You said that's evolved over time. It, it has. Uh, in the early days, nobody cared much what color they were. They were roan, they were speckled, spotted, they were brown, black, uh, uh, the bays, like Budweiser has. And uh, with popularity of Budweiser having solid color with the white stripe and the white legs, that kind of uh, evolved. Everyone else wanted to do that too. So uh, that is by far the most popular. And uh, most people today try to breed them for solid color, whether it's solid uh, bay like Budweiser or brown or black. There still are some that are roan and speckled around. There are still some that uh, have black legs around. And, um, you know, every, even though you try to breed a solid colored with white legs and white face, uh, there's <laughs> throwbacks. Every year you get a throwback mm -hmm. uh, or two. So I remember the last time you and I chatted and I was asking you about their temperament, which I want you to expand upon. You said the best way I can describe it is they're they're just oversized dogs. They're always in your pocket. I remember that mm -hmm. quote from you. What what's what's their mannerisms? Well, they are like that. They are like a big pet. Uh, they're very very friendly. Uh, they always want to come over and see what you're doing or if you got a treat for them or whatever. And uh, for the most part, they're very easy to get along with. Um, that even expands into breaking and training and all. Uh, if you go kind of slow and easy with them, they are very responsive generally to uh, whatever you want to do, but they're very laid back. I'd, I'd say in, in having handled most breeds of horses, they are close to the number one as far as their laid back temperament. Not real nippy or bitey, because sometimes mm. I've been around no. horses where they I don't know if nip is the right word, but they do like to kind of right. bite at you and right. snort at you. But I, it's not that I've been around your horses all that much, but they're just so friendly. That's the only way that I can describe it. They are. The whole, whole breed is that way, generally. And what about feeding? <laughs> you know, something so massive probably has to eat a lot. They do. Uh, they expect to get fed every day, uh, twice a day or more. <laughs> um, they will eat, uh, depending on the, the entire ration, whether they're on uh, pasture or not, but uh, 10 to 15 pounds of grain at least a day, some of them more than that. Uh, they can very easily eat a bale of hay a day. Uh, we feed a very high protein hay and uh, uh, feed some alfalfa in the hay. It, it just seems to help keep uh, keep their condition and, and all. So uh, yeah, they uh, they like their feed. You have a special little one in the in the area behind us. In fact, you have several young ones. Mm -hmm. um, I'll let you talk about that, but you do have a special one behind us. I don't know where they, they might have head back in the barn to get some cool air, but yeah. you've been up. You haven't had much sleep in the last three months. Right. Yeah, he refused to nurse his mother, so uh, uh, we started out feeding him with the bottle. I would milk out the, his mother into the bottle, and he would take the bottle, which was kind of lucky. Uh, so we did that every two hours for the first couple of weeks, and then we stretched it to three hours, and then that's 24 hours a day. And, uh, and after, I think, five or six weeks, well, I stretched it to every four hours. And now just this week, I cut out his night feeding, so I don't have to go to the barn at one o'clock in the morning now. <laughs> so you got a few extra hours, that's yes. good. You know, the Clydesdale, uh, while, it, and I keep saying majestic, it's, it, it is, and they're just so, you're just kind of in awe when you look at them. And I know you said a lot of times traffic will go by the farm and mm -hmm. people will stop and just stare in the field. And, and I, I know the feeling, because it's just, they're just so beautiful. But there are other uses for Clydesdales, uh, several uses actually. Mm -hmm. And that dates back to when they were pulling wagons. Right. Well, and there still are some people that use them in the field actually. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, some Amish folks and just some regular folks that just like Clydesdales that still work them on small farms. And so, I mean, that's a legitimate use that they actually work. Uh, there are a couple of loggers that uh, pull logs out of the woods with horses that uh, use them. 
and they use other breeds as well. And uh, there are a lot of carriage services that like to use Clydesdales. Uh, they just kind of show you in front of the fancy carriages when mm -hmm. you're downtown and all, uh, or at a wedding or whatever. And um, a lot of the uh, circuses and petting zoos and that sort of thing that we deal with uh, like to have a Clydesdale for everyone to look at because it, they just kind of draw people. Uh, mm -hmm. See, you got to go look at them or pet them or whatever. <laughs> That's so. right. You, you mentioned it early in the interview talking about kind of the history with Anheuser-Busch and their association with Clydesdales, but you too have a history. Um, you spent a lot of time over in St. Louis in the stables. Yeah, in 1966, uh, Dad had the opportunity, he was asked to go down to help establish their new breeding farm, uh, just actually for the summer. And at the end of the summer, they asked him to stay on, and so he did, and it was 30 years. He, he became manager in 67 of the Clydesdales, and uh, he stayed there for 30 years before he retired and came back to the farm. Brother and I stayed here on the farm then, and then at one point they needed uh, an assistant manager down there, so I went down for seven years and then uh, my brother went down and I came back to the farm. So we've kept the farm going even though we've done other things too. Mm -hmm. your, uh, your Clydesdales have gone all over the world and you're gonna talk about some of their travels, but you have a pretty, uh, pretty long clientele list of some very popular uh, people that I know our viewers will know. You have, you have provided horses to the likes of yeah, George Foreman is is a client. We took uh, some horses to him and spent some time with him, uh, teaching him to harness and drive and take care of them and all. Uh, Dolly Parton's group, uh, we've supplied horses there. Uh, Shepherd of the Hills in Branson, um, the uh, heiress of Campbell Soup and heiress of uh, Warehouser Lumber and just kind of a whole host of, of people that uh, uh, have, I bet you when you get that phone and... call from George Foreman, you're, <laughs> you want to check the caller ID to make sure it's legitimate. Sometimes, and generally it's their manager or, or farm guys or something mm -hmm. that uh, uh, actually come here and we deal with. And, uh, and that was the case with Michael Jackson. We, we worked with him, but it was through his farm manager Ranch. and all. Sure. And uh, that's, that's often the, the case. And, uh, we, we're dealing with some very high-level uh, political people in other countries and in wealthy families and all in other countries and all too. So uh, we kind of had to learn how to uh, uh, deal with that and sure. handle ourselves and all because it's a whole different world when you're, it's not like selling to, to your neighbor the right. next county or anything like that. So. How is the Clydesdales a travel companion when you have to deal with your clients that are global um how do you that's a pretty intense travel itinerary for the clydesdale mm -hmm. well the, with them and all the breeds that we uh, ship and all and deliver uh, uh, there is a protocol that we have to uh, abide by depending on what country they're going to it's usually a 30 day to 60 day quarantine here uh, whether it's our own horses or horses we bought to deliver to somebody um, we take them to one of the approved airports and we hope it's Chicago because that's the closest, but we have shipped out of uh, Kennedy, we've shipped out of Toronto, Miami, Seattle, LA. Uh, just depends on where they're going as to where, they're, where they will allow us to uh, ship out of. And it's almost like and a stall that you it's, ride in with it, the it is. It's, it's like a two horse or three horse trailer without wheels. Mm -hmm. And they are designed so that they fit on all the roller mechanisms and all of the other equipment at the airports. So for the airport personnel, other than going a little bit slower and handle a little, little bit easier, it's no different than <laughs> not handling throwing anything that else. They can't right, do that. Right. So uh, we have uh, had some loads that have been charter loads where we'll uh, take 75 or 80 head on a plane and then there's one or two of us, uh, depending on how many horses 
uh, goes on the plane. We carry our own water and feed and all, so we, uh, we can take care of them in transit and all that. So what gives you the most joy and pleasure? I, I mean, you don't know a life without horses at Clydesdale. That's all you've done. What, when you think about it, it may be a question that you don't really ponder, but what gives you the most joy about these beautiful animals? Well, I just, quite honestly, uh, when we're here and nobody else is here and they're out in the field and they're just eating and everybody is healthy and happy and all I like sitting out by the pasture and just watching them in the evenings when we're done, uh, mm -hmm. that's very uh, pleasing and relaxing, yeah. As far as, as a different uh, pleasure or satisfaction, I guess, is when we deliver horses to new customers and everything works well, the new customer's happy, they understand the horse and how to take care of them and, and everybody everywhere along the way is, is happy and so hopefully we have repeat customers. But in a lot of these countries we've gone to, we've taken the first American horses into that country ever and the first heavy horses. Uh, there's been six countries that we introduced Clydesdales to that Clydesdales had never been in before. So we go over and help train the people to take care of the horses and to uh, ride or drive or whatever. But uh, And that must give you some joy to know that there's a half a dozen countries that you're responsible for bringing the breed to. It must make you happy. Well, kind of makes you feel yeah. feel like you maybe have accomplished something, I guess. Yes. Um, because in all these cases, and, and the same with all of our exports, um, it's very, very intense from start to finish and all. And uh, so you always have a little hesitation until they are at their final destination and whoever's taking care of them there really understands how to take care of them. And, um, we get calls routinely from even veterinarians or whoever in these other countries that have no experience with big horses in particular, but a lot of, a lot of the countries don't have that much horse experience in their veterinary community. So uh, they call back here to Lovington and ask what to do about this or that or something else. <laughs> I find that a little uh, unnerving sometimes. Legacy of feral farms, grandkids, that are interested, do they come out? Yes. Are you teaching them everything that you know? They can all ride and drive already. The oldest one is 16, the youngest one is uh, nine, and uh, there are four grandkids. I uh, have son and daughter. No doubt the farm is gonna continue on after I'm not here, so <laughs> that, that kind of makes you feel good. Absolutely. Phil Farrell of Farrell Farms here in Lovington, surrounded by a, uh, sweat bees. We were just talking about that. The sweat bees are out in full force. We're filming this episode in almost August, so humid weather, I yes. think, brings them out. But thank you again for sharing your knowledge of the Clydesdale and for sharing your story with our viewers here on the Paw Report. Anytime. Excellent. And we thank you for joining us for this episode on the road. I'm your host, Kelly Runyon, and we'll see you next time. If you're a veterinarian, trainer, groomer, specialist, rescue organization, or shelter that would like to partner with the Paw Report by providing expert guests for the show, please contact us by emailing weiu at weiu.net or call 217-581-5956. If you have a topic you'd like to see on the show or questions for our experts, contact us with those too. Okaw Vet Clinic in Tuscola and Dr. Sally Foote remind you to properly take care of your pets and are happy to help support the Paw Report on WEIU. Okaw Vet Clinic located at 140 West Sale Street in downtown Tuscola. More information available at okawvetclinic.com. Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of the Power Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, Authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston.